stage four is perhaps the most important of all of the stages because stage five is the earthquake. We're going to talk about that. Stage five is where you have this burgeoning sense of self-love abundance. Your SLDD is in transition. You, um, you are, are ready to start setting boundaries to people that don't like to have boundaries. This is storm. This is, this is um, when state, so stage four, um, it was a stage that did not exist until about a year ago. It used to be the nine stage treatment method. And then I realized that most of my work in stage five, which was helping people set boundaries in a hostile environment, it was preparation. And that if I did not help someone prepare for it, stage five inevitably failed. And I realized that stage four in, in its, um, this preparation for the narcissistic storm, mastering power and control dynamics, it was a discrete treatment phase that required um, specific um, treatment interventions, um, lessons, discussions. It is all about knowing what's going to happen beforehand. So many times, and I think it's kind of funny, because people would say, you know, Ross, you're a psychic. How did you know he or she was going to do that? And I, that happens to me so often that I will predict exactly what the PNARC, PNARC is the short term for pathological narcissism. But they, people would say, how did you know my PNARC or my narcissist was going to do that? How did you know? And to me, it is so almost cause and effect, stimulus response. If you understand a narcissist, they're predictable. I even had one person, and it cracked me up. I think it was a, I don't know if it was a comment on YouTube or Instagram. I don't know what it was. But they called me a narcissist whisperer. <laughs> And <laughs> primary goals are proactively addressing all imminent risk, gathering accurate storm data. Using this as a metaphor is if you know about a storm that's coming, you can protect yourself. So you can weather the storm. You can board up your heart through active uses of observe, don't absorb. You can keep safe thwart retaliation, create alternate living plans, have choices, maintain emotional and physical safety, and protect self and, de and dependent loved ones. So this is going to be a storm, and, and stage five is going to be very, very difficult. Stage four starts with my Surgeon General warning, and let me read it to you. Ceasing one's codependency or self-love deficit disorder will result in abnormally high rates of conflict, disapproval, and heartbreak. Other risks include rejection and abandonment, as well as a loss of so-called loving, supportive, and loyal friends and loved ones. Anticipate at least six months of debilitating core shame, self-doubt, and pathological loneliness. Well, that's like if you smoke, you're going to have emphysema and die of cancer. It's, except the difference of my Surgeon General warning is if you do this, you are going to finally experience self-love abundance. But it's going to come at a cost. And this Surgeon General warning is an ethical mandate that is so important that I tell everyone repeatedly that if you move forward, you should expect these losses. But capital B, capital U, capital T. But this is the way for you to finally break free of your SLDD and to find self-love abundance. The best thing you can do is give a version of the Surgeon General warning and then see someone say, I'm not ready. Because if someone's not ready and they proceed, the failure of it 
might be so traumatic that they'll never come back and do it again. Um, now, I need part of my Surgeon General warning requires me to say that um, I destroy marriages. <laughs> and, and I say that as a joke because I don't actually try to end marriages. I don't um, suggest people to divorce. But there is no way um, that if you are in a relationship with a pathological narcissist who has a personality disorder, who has manipulated you, your children, and your friends, and because they have a personality disorder, there's no way that they're going to change. And if you start to set boundaries, the marriages don't survive. So here is the gravestone. Um, Self-love recovery treatment induced marriage death. 2001 to the moment of self-love abundance. Rest in peace, SLD. Good riddance, pathological narcissist. Self-love recovery treatment is a marriage killer because of the nature of the personality disorder and the dynamics between the SLD and the PNARC. Um, it never, um, I never say leave him, divorce him, divorce her. And you'll, and you'll notice that my, my videos and all of my material, they, it, they, they don't tell you what to do in order to hurt the narcissist. They tell you what to do in order to achieve self-love abundance, and they warn you on what is going to happen. Um, the the PNARC has personality disorder. They're incapable of change. Um, unless somehow the change helps them. The relationship won't survive because it, ta because it takes mutual accountability for the abuse. It takes cessation of the abuse and fairness, accountability, support, and empathy. That's not going to happen with a personality disordered individual who's either got ASPD, antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, or narcissistic personality disorder. Um, which is why um, stage four helps people realistically understand the risks. So if you explain that ahead of time, people can, if you're not ready to do the recovery work, people then will stop going to therapy. That's happened a lot of times with me, and that's good. You tell people that if you move forward and you give them the Surgeon General warning and you explain the, um, through predictive awareness what will happen, they might say that's too much for me. And I do not shame them. I just assume that's their choice and more often than not they will come back later. Um, S4, stage four, is all about prediction and preparation. The Surgeon General warning, it's true. You are going to lose 70 to 80 percent, 85 percent of the people in your life. If you are an SLD, that means you are unhappily connected to people as a person, an object, a, um, a way to make other people feel good. If you start saying no to people, even when they're not narcissists, I'm talking about people that might be a plus four, a plus three, or some friends who are fellow SLDs. Once you start saying no, and these people are not in therapy, and they, and they cannot love, respect, and care for you, for you setting boundaries, they're going to have a reaction. It's very clear that the narcissist will have a reaction. That I don't have to explain, and we're gonna, but I will. We're going to go into that. But what I don't have a slide on um, is the reaction of an SLD, another SLD. People lose their SLD friends because it's almost, um, it's like when I had problems with marijuana, weed, I smoked it all the time.
and I got out of treatment, and I didn't want to lose my friends. So I hung out with them, and I made them uncomfortable because me being sober and straight reminded them of what was wrong with them, and they annoyed them out of me because they were just sitting around listening to music and like saying stupid things. Now I'm, I'm, now I'm talking about being 18 years old. I'm sure this, it still applies at any other age. But the, the point is if you have SLD friends or your clients are connected to SLD friends, they are going to feel very uncomfortable also with your change. One is it's going to remind them of what they're blind to and invisible to. Two, is um, they're going to resent you um, in not being like them, and it's going to actually have impact on the relationship. Because if you have an SLD friend, and they says, well, let's just you know, skip our, our girls' night out, and because you know, John you know, you know, needs to go to the car show. Um, and you say to your friend, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to do that. I need to set a boundary. Your, your SLD friend is going to feel like you're going to put them into a double bind. That you're, going to, you're asking them to support you in a way that they're not ready to because they're still in denial. So you will lose 70 to 85 percent. And by the way, by the time you finish stage four, you will be prepared for it and it won't be catastrophic but it is, sounds catastrophic in the beginning. And remember the importance of informed consent. The last thing that I want to do as a therapist is to um, tell people ahead of time um, that you know, they're going to lose all these friends and family, and they're saying, I'm not sure if I want to do it. And then I said, well, let's just continue anyways. That's irresponsible if, uh, psychotherapy. If anything, it's malpractice. Um, predictions and preparations for triangulations, gaslighting, parental alienation syndrome, sabotage by the PNARC's flying monkeys. One of these terms that got created in, I don't know, YouTube or something, and now it has its own meaning. But flying monkeys are um, all of the, the people that support the narcissists and are their eyes and ears in, in you know, execute what they want to do in order to please the narcissist. Public and secret shaming, blockades, um, whatever the power pathological needs to do to, in order to stop success. So stage four means the stuff's going to hit the fan, and it's going to be really bad. And it starts with warning, because according to the famous Sun Tzu, who was, um, who wrote, the book, The Art of War and Peace. Does anyone want to correct me? Anyone? Am I correct? I am correct. Good. It's, um, he, um, and I want to quote him. It is said that if you know your enemies and know yourself, you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. If you don't know your enemies but know yourself, you will win one and lose one. If you do not know your enemies nor yourself, you will be imperiled in every single battle. And that's the basis of predictive awareness. It is a prerequisite for observe, don't absorb. And I have yet to talk about it yet in this seminar, and I will. But I bring it up beforehand because how many people here know about my observe, don't absorb method? Okay, it is one of my better ideas. Um, you're going to hear about it today, but it's, it's a way to um, keep yourself emotionally protected by a narcissist while setting boundaries. And we'll be talking about that soon. Um, predictive awareness is the in depth study of your narcissist, learning and mastering their arsenal of tactics. Your narcissist has a, just like any general, um, um, or any you know, war commander, they have, um, they ha or even a football team for that matter, they have the they have a um, a typical offensive strategy. How they try to win and how they make someone lose. An in-depth study of that changes everything. Learning and mastering how the pathological 
narcissists manipulate. So, so you study their tactics, but now you also can learn about how they actually succeed and why they do that. And these are very important discussions because in those moments, you can see outside of yourself. You can see, like a, it's like you're watching a movie of you and the narcissist, and you can see, like, like when people watch a football game um, after, uh, when they, people like football players will study a football game, for that matter, any sport, um, after the game, they can see clearly what they did and did not do wrong because they're standing outside of the game and looking at themselves. You, you understand what they do, um, they do to the person, how they turn people against themselves. And that is hugely important once you can identify what they do, how they do it, and how they're able to actually gaslight and manipulate a person and make them um, subject to their own weakness. And I call their domination and control strategies, which I call wrestling moves, and that parenthesis term, wrestling moves, will make sense in a few slides. Narcissistic abuse is neutralized through knowledge and skill acquisition. I cannot emphasize the importance of stage four in understanding um, what the narcissist is, what he does, how he impacts you, your vulnerability for it, how you perpetuate it, um, knowledge and skill acquisition stops it. Now, there's a saying, you know, um, how, um, how many hands does it take to clap? Well, unless you're smart and you do this, it takes two. Um, if you understand how the narcissist hurts you, you know that it takes you to somehow be involved with them. Um, as much as you learn about them, allows you to win at the chess game, um, and it helps you understand the ins and the outs of when you get to stage five. You don't want to get to stage five and be surprised by anything. Um, you need to not only SLDs need to not only predict everything, but understand what they do and the narcissists do and people connected to them do. Because once you figure that out, you become a psychic like me. Um, and you'll be surprised how simple it is to predict the narcissist once you get the right information.